This is what we do and why we do it, baby. We roll Covering MMA from all over the world, this is the premier stop for all your combat sports needs. MMA Junkie Radio, the only show broadcasting live from the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. The lights are on and the mics are hot. It's time to get your MMA fix, junkies. Take it away, Big John. Gorgeous George and Goes, are you ready? Junkie Nation, are you ready? Well, let's get it all. From the fight capital of the world, inside the beautiful Manalay Bay Race and Sportsbook, you are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show, the only show that matters. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me, as always, is the (laughs) devious and dastardly goes. Our East co-host, back East, handling the producing duties, Andre the Giant. What's up, guys? Hello. What up? Hey. Oh, yet another day, a hump day. Wednesday, April 21st. Uh, yeah, I was going to say yet another day in my sports fandom where things just can't go my way. It makes me so mad, and I'm carrying this into the show, and it's not your guys' fault, but... What are you going to do? I'm not going to fake it, that's for sure. We're babies, though, right? A little bit? Because we've had it we're relatively passionate. well because uh, we're both Laker fans. And yeah. We've had some great Laker years. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are fans of other teams that wish they could have experienced what we've experienced in our lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, you're a 49er fan. What is that, five Super Bowls? I'm a Redskin fan. That's three. I've been hurting for a while. Yours were relatively... Not that long ago. What when was the last one? Ninety five. The ninety four, ninety five season. Uh, are we just a little spoiled? But last night, what happened was brutal. That I was just talking to Jimmy Smith and Ryan McKennell. Yeah. And Jimmy had brought one up that that hurt him. I mean, literally he got Texas punted USC. in the nuts. He's a USC fan. He's a USC fan oh, too. Nice. He's a Dodger oh. fan, a Laker fan. Yeah, that one stung. That's two thousand five. But last night, the Vegas Golden Knights, and then today, Manchester United. It just doesn't end. It really doesn't end. And what are you going to do, man? It's, like I said, this is MMA Junkie Radio. We have a fun show planned for you today. Let me tell you about it a little bit and just let me vent for the next two hours from time to time, and we'll be all right. Today, we are going to be talking to Sarah Kaufman. She is going to be fighting in the PFL, Professional Fighters League, Season 2. Uh, she is one of the lightweights. That's right. The former Bantamweight champion over at Invicta and Strike Force is moving up two weight classes to 155 pounds to participate in uh, PFL's lightweight tournament. Or, sorry, they don't like that word. Uh, the regular season followed by the playoffs. And it's true. They don't like that word, and I respect it. So I really try and do my best to call it regular season and playoffs. But if you ever hear us not call it that or Grand Prix, there's a reason. They just prefer to use that format of a regular season and a playoff, similar to the way we experience uh, most sports. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. I don't think that's bad to share, um, but if you ever wondered that, then then that's the reason. She'll join us at 6.20 p.m. Pacific, 9.20 p.m. Eastern time. We'll talk to her about her first fight that she has coming up. And they're part of week one, basically. If you'll recall, we had a recent guest as well on the show that's going to be fighting on. In the, it was Chris Curtis. He's fighting with the welterweight. So it's the men's welterweight and the women's lightweight that are on display in week one. They're out in Long Island. All right, that's in May. And we're also going to be talking to, this news to Andre the Giant, but a late booking, James Krause will also be on the show. UFC lightweight slash welterweight. I say it that way because he's on a fight fight win streak. And the first two wins were at lightweight, and as a welterweight, he's three and zero. But he hasn't fought since mid 2018, so we'll catch up with him. Hey, when's your next fight? And he's also becoming one of the newest coaching sensations out there. And uh, I've heard it from a lot of fighters that the, the the guy just really knows the game, and is a great coach, and runs a great practice. And so that's why you see him. In a lot of corners, like he'll be in Zach Cummings' corner, he'll be in Megan Megan Anderson's corner, for example, and uh, you know, oftentimes, like he's their head coach, but oftentimes you'll just see him kind of like as a what do you call it, a corner man. Whether he's the lead or not, you know, that's up to it, the interpretation of whoever's we're talking about. But uh, Tim Elliott is, is another fighter, mm-hmm. 
So we'll talk to him, and we'll see what's next with him, and you know when can we see him fight again? Because I'd like I'd like to see him capitalize on that fight fight win streak. Those aren't easy to get in the UFC. Trust me, he's been doing this for a long time, and I know that he's also a pretty savvy businessman. He owns a couple of Metro PCSs, right? Yeah, and yeah, along with the gym, and I, I could see him being one of those guys that wants to leave with as many marbles as possible. Okay, so he's. After Sarah Kaufman, 9.40 p.m. Eastern, uh, 6.40 p.m. Pacific time. If you want to call in at any portion during the show, 877-FIGHT-93, 877-344-4893. And you can tweet us at MMA on Sirius XM. That works not only for our show, but all the shows on our channel. And uh, I'm at MMA and Junkie George, and Goes is at the Goes if you want to hit us up directly. All right, Goes. So this weekend we have, because enough of the PED talk, we had a lot. Of it this uh, this week, More and than I wanna, we want to yeah. Let's talk a little bit of X's and O's, and then we'll circle back to some news. And I'm sure, the, there's always some drama to talk about out there. But this weekend we have a interesting matchup at middleweight. I'm not gonna call it fantastic or great, and just shove a bunch of crap down people's throats. Mm -hmm. It's a solid matchup. It's a it's an interesting matchup, and I'll tell you why. That's how I would describe it pre-fight. I feel like. Ronaldo Jacare Souza has earned his stripes. He's a fantastic middleweight. But Jack Hermanson's rising, and he may wind up being a fantastic middleweight. Thereby, when we look back on this fight, we may, we may go, wow, remember when those two titans clashed? But Jack Hermanson's earning his stripes, so right now it's an, it's an interesting one because Hermanson put himself in that position by beating a ranked fighter, a former champion over at WSOF, now known as PFL, in David Branch. And he made quick work, work of him. Via submission. And by the way, that's Branch's strength. Mm -hmm. So we did that. And because he got out of there unscathed and healthy and it was quick, they said, how would you like to fill in for Yoel, Yoel Romero, who was supposed to face Ronaldo Souza? And he said, I'm on it, which I think was perfect for him. Like, I love the Smart timing move. of it. Yes, exactly. And there's a lot to gain. And granted, there might be a little, there's going to be something to lose. But if you lose to Jock Ray, normally it's, hey, it's no big deal. That's Jock Ray for crying out loud. And Jock Ray on short notice. So I think it's one of those where you stand to gain a lot and not lose much. Mm -hmm. Plus, you always get paid. Every time you fight, you always get paid. So Jacare is one of my favorite fighters to watch. And it's funny because when he first made that transition, he was a fantastic, phenomenal grappler who was giving MMA a try. And right away when he started in mixed martial arts, I thought he was good. He was a good mixed martial artist, but he didn't. He wasn't complacent with that. You know, he was working on his striking. A lot of stuff evolved in that department. And I think little by little, he was getting better and better. And now I think you can say he's a fantastic mixed martial artist. Oh, yeah. He's one of the first ones that didn't just try and get by on one ability. You know, some wrestlers come in just that's all they want to do is wrestle. And uh, some uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu players come in. That's all they want to do is grapple. He was one of the first ones that took initiative. Damian Maia is another one that just really immersed himself in wrestling, and it's paid off. And he's fun to watch, so really you can match him up with just about anyone. But Jack Hermanson is so much fun in the sense that he kind of just doesn't give a shit. You know, he doesn't seem like he's afraid of anyone. And I think that's the type of attitude that you have to have in this matchup because you just came off a fight in a camp for a completely different fighter, right. now you're getting thrusted in, and this has happened to Jock Gray before in the past. In 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 in, uh, in Strike Force, that happened to him one time. And I remember Bristol Monday was the one that took that fight. And he took it like on a week's notice, and he had to go it's, to Brazil, didn't he? Yeah, and it's not that easy. It's everybody thinks that all the pressures on the Hermanson side. There's a little pressure on the Jock Gray side too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's when you're sitting there doing your whole camp based on one fighter, and they give you a new one. It's a little tough to have to adjust no matter whether you feel like it's an easier matchup or a harder matchup. It's still tougher, and I think it's more tougher mentally than it is physically. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I've seen these these types of turnarounds for fighters in the past, and when it works out, when you can get two fights in, I've seen it as soon as two weeks. I think Chris Lieben was one of those that pulled that off. He was one of the first. Yes, or in like a month or in six weeks. I'm telling you, you are on the tip of everyone's tongue in terms of what's next in the middleweight division. Like, like let's say Hermanson pulls this off, and when they start discussing Whitaker versus Adesanya, and you know who might be net, I'm telling you, people will be going the Joker. You know, they'll be turn, they'll be pivoting and saying, "Remember, he submitted Branch, and he got past Jokere again." Jokere, excuse me. Again, this is on the premise if he were to win on Saturday, and so he's going to be the talk of the town. 
Remember, about a year ago, it was Izzy and Costa. Mm-hmm. Izzy was very busy. He had six fights in about 16 months. And that's why he's an interim world champion. Costa, unfortunately, had a couple injuries. But Costa was right there. Costa was actually leading that race. He had, he was supposed to fight Yoel Romero last uh, November at the New York card. And I think first one guy pulled out, then the other guy pulled out. And so he's still sorting out what's next for him. And in the meantime, Izzy's already wearing gold. Yeah. Izzy's already going to be able to cash in on some pay-per-view points when he does fight with Whitaker. Izzy's going to possibly fight Whitaker in a stadium. So everything's right for him. I'm not shitting on Costa, by the way. I'm just saying that's just the way it played out. Joker, Jack Hermanson, he might be in that, in that type of, of a position. And remember, it's up to the fighters to have that type of hustle. Uh, most of the time, that hustle is, is beneficial. There's other times when you can sit back and just let the division play out, and it can work out you know, in your favor as well. I've seen that as well. But most of the time, if you're one of those guys that just has a run of fights, I'm not saying four fights every year, you got to do it nonstop. Hell no, you're tail down your body. But at some point, you got to hit a couple of those runs. Here's what I think is important as well. And you tell me if you agree or if I'm a big dummy. I think the manager, for as stressful as the situation is for Jack Hermanson right now, still has to find about 30 minutes to pull him aside and go, look. I know this matchup is important. Your focus is on the fight. But I wrote down about 10 to 15 questions here that you may get right after the fight if you win. This is how you need to answer those questions. Because Israel Asanya, for as talented as he is, a lot of it had to do with the type of answers that he gave on Joe Rogan's podcast after the fight. He just really made you believe in his skill set and that he did deserve to maybe jump the line a little bit. I think Jack can do that if he can get a win. And by the way, one of those fights was Anderson Silva. And forget about the win itself. Forget about the bonus. Forget about the training camp. How cool is it to be able to say one day when he's a grandfather, he's got his grandkids on his lap, and say, I fought Anderson Silva. However great Mm -hmm. Adesanya turns out to be, maybe he eclipses him or maybe he doesn't. But to say, hey, I shared the octagon with that dude. Again, it all had to do because he put himself in that position. And that's why he wants that time off. So when you hear Whitaker and Adesanya in September, and Adesanya's like, wow, pump the brakes a little bit. September's too soon. It's because he's had six fights in 16 months. But anyway, back to Joker Hermanson. He comes in as an underdog about plus 158, 162, 164, somewhere around there. So this is a minus 200, minus 180, minus 189. So as always, we tell you, shop around if you have the ability to take your business to all the different houses out there, wherever it's legal. You know, usually the Europeans, the UK punters, all them, they can go anywhere. Americans, you got to go somewhere where it's legal. So I always like to leave that uh, disclaimer there. Now, uh, Jacare, we have a little bit of audio from the Luke Thomas show. So this is, uh, this is in regards to Ronaldo Souza, who headlines the UFC card coming up on Saturday. It used to be, I think it's still called UFC on ESPN3, but it's going to be on Fight Pass. I'll tell you more about that when we come back. Hit that, Andre. I will be a number one contender for sure because me and UFC have, have a deal right now. And I have to say for dinner, why to UFC or whatever. Don't forget about this. I come to this fight. And they promised me a title shot. Okay. First of all, great improvements in the English. Look how he's able to communicate his thoughts mm-hmm. and put wait, it wait, out there. Time out. Oh. Time out. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just kind of glitched here, and it just jumped into break. So, uh, yeah, my bad on that. We're on commercial? Yeah, we're on commercial right now. Okay. Oh, did well, we hit the uh, – did we still hit the Sousa thing or not? Yeah, the whole clip.
Put excellence and excitement in your Vitamix. Add ice and you get MMA Junkie Radio. Now, anytime you know English, it benefits you as a Brazilian fighter. Ah. <laughs> All right, audience, audience, have a little sense of humor. We, uh, our, our producer, Andre the Giant, had his finger on the trigger and he thinks he's Doc Holliday, so I think he had... <laughs> <laughs> he, he must have thought he had a showdown, and he pulled that trigger. So we went to break. We went, ba- we came back, and I was just trying to c- finish the sentence that I had started. But we were talking about Jacare. I just wanted to give him a, a fist bump because he's learned English. He can do an interview. He can communicate his thoughts. That was step one. Mm-hmm. And two, you know, he's kind of putting his foot down. He's done a little bit on social media, and now he's doing it pre-fight, on fight week. I think it's important. Now, will they get him far? I don't know. You have to be. You have to set the script. Pretty consistently. You can't say, you know, he used to fumble the hell out of these types of um, announcements. Mm. Jose Aldo. I hate my fighter pay. Uh. I, I might be retiring soon. And then a week later, him and Dana White and Conor McGregor would be touring the whole world. And a reporter would say, hey, Jose, you've expressed interest that you're not happy in your pay. You know, Dana's right there. Uh, have you had a chance to talk to him or or, or would you like to tell him anything now? No, I'm happy with my pay. Oh, mm. come on. I mean, he did this a few times. Yeah. And he pushed out. You know what I mean? And Dana, look, he's he rules all in terms of the UFC. I'm not going to say he doesn't have power. But he respects his guys enough that if they tell him something, in a day it's like that, in a situation like that, he'll go, well, we'll talk about it later, Jose. And then politely say something or whatever. But... He wouldn't uh, all of a sudden just trash Jose at that point. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I think you could step or to him. Or put an end to the press conference. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Well, you know, you could step to him uh, you know, and, and say something if you wanted to, and, and I'm sure they could address it later. But I, I, I thought Jose you know, needed to be more consistent with that. So let's hope Jacare is also consistent with that throughout the week. And then post-fight, should he beat Jack Hermanson? I'm all tied up here. Should he beat uh, Jack Hermanson? Stay with it and say, I demand the winner of Whitaker and Adesanya. Because let me tell you something. There are other fighters out there that will step on your neck to get to where you're going. Oh, yeah. And that can be homies. It can be former teammates, current teammates. We have seen it all in the past 12 years. Nothing shocks me. I'm telling you, you have to be just as aggressive and just as much of a hustler. And it's all business. It has nothing to do with, you know, like uh, you're going to stop being homeboys or whatever because that's what you are away from the sport. But while you're both competing in the same division, training partners, I mean, I'm telling you, training partners have become enemies. Can I circle back to Jacare real quick and and the last thing that I think makes him brilliant? Yeah. All right. When you're trying to figure out who someone is on the roster and you go, you know, the jiu-jitsu guy, bro, there's a million of those. The Brazilian, yeah, got a lot of those too. You know. And you do the little chomp. Chakra, yeah. Boom. You know who, exactly who that is. Yeah. He's been brilliant in that. Sense. He has been. The little crawl that he does into the cage. I like it. It's hard to forget. See, Jacare is just as decorated as Damian Maya in the world of jiu-jitsu. Damian, though, however, I think carries the most respect when it comes to jiu-jitsu. And by that, I mean if the fight hits the ground, you go, oh, it's over. It's just a matter of time before Dan- Damian Maya finishes you because he does have a lot of finishes to his credit but Jacare uh, has those types of skills it's just that he's also developed a pretty formidable striking game and he just doesn't carry that reputation but he is right up there he's a legit black belt that competes in mixed martial arts but he's getting older you know I don't know how much tread is left on the tires I don't know if he'll go into his 41 42 like Yo Romero has Uh, so if that's your play stick to it all right Greg Hardy, he's back this weekend. Do you think he deserves to be the co-main event of any UFC on ESPN? And now they're going to ESPN Plus, but when they created the card, they were headed to ESPN. Based on his skills and, I guess, popularity, and let's not forget his last performance, which is coming off a loss, which I think Mm -hmm. you have to consider all that when you're trying to place these fighters on the card. Based on his performances? No. Performance. Uh, 
based on well, he you only has the one loss. You can go back to well, no, no, but I'm saying overall, all of his performances, mm-hmm. does he deserve it? Probably not. Really? Um, no, a That's co-main a spot. Nice well, I mean, they're in Florida. He's part of American Top Team. He's a popular uh, NFL. Well, fighter. I was going to say for the wrong reason. Based on his popularity, mm-hmm. I understand why they would do that because they want to be able to put his name on the bill. He was pretty exciting though, Dana White Contender Series. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's not what. Uh, that's not what. I mean, there's a lot of fighters that don't get co-main. Jacare, how many times has Jacare been co-main? Right, like I mean, there's a lot of guys that don't receive that type of status for Greg Hardy to get it just like that. All right. I mean, I guess we get why he's there, but some people will look at that popularity and say some of it is because he was a, a good player in the NFL, and then some of it's for other reasons. And mm-hmm. I think that's the problem that a lot of people have. But at this point. I think the point has been made. The UFC has kind of given their little blanket statement. Mm-hmm. Um, it appears that they're just going to chug along with doing that. So I've kind of just learned to put it in the back door and just move on. On the same card, they do have Alex Oliveira versus Mike Perry, Glover Teixeira versus Jan Kutalaba, and John Lineker versus Corey Sanhagen. Based on those three... I think any one of those could have been the, been the main event. But I have to imagine, A, he's Ticket just... Ticket-wise, though? What? Ticket-wise, though? The main event? Oh, my bad. Co-main event. They could have been the co-main event. Either Lineker Sanhagen, Teixeira Kutalaba, or Perry Oliveira. I think they could have been the co-main event and not Greg Hardy. Mm-hmm. I imagine they arrived at this decision because former NFL player on ESPN, yes, carrying the bad baggage that that comes with you know the allegations that he had um as an nfl player he's an exciting heavyweight but he is coming off a loss so i I gotta imagine it's just the former nfl player on espn is what it boiled down to and that trumped everything else look the problem is a lot of the other fighters of these six have you asked them all hey what do you think they'd all go i don't care i get paid the same you know Mm -hmm. so the ufc can kind of do those things um you know what i mean the fact that he's a, a heavyweight, too, I think kind of helps, right? If he would have gone through everything he went through, let's say he was a wide receiver or something, mm-hmm. but lighter weight class, yeah. I think it would be a little bit more difficult. But just because he's so big and he can knock someone out just like that, I think that probably helps out, you know? Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's our mom there. Yeah, that is our see. mom on the screen You're on right the camera, there. mom. See? <laughs> <laughs> our mom just big-footed our uh, set right now. <laughs> When you watch the uh, well footage of Bigfoot. She had slipped this in, and all you could see was her hand. And she had slipped this in. So I was like, okay, she's doing a good job. And then, whoop, she just walked <laughs> in front of the camera. <laughs> Thank you, though. Yes. She brought a Starbucks. Yes. All right. Uh, well, so the UFC tends to make these decisions, and, and I guess he just happens to be the a hot ticket. I, I think coming off a win would be a little bit more acceptable, but... See, the ESPN audience just doesn't digest that. They don't look mm-hmm. into, like, is he coming off a win? Is he a contender? Is he this? Is he that? He's just Greg Hardy, the guy he's playing in the NFL. They so look at the, the menu, UFC, not the ingredients. The UFC just kind of, I think the UFC kind of, in their matchmaker meeting, they, at some point they go, remember, man, the audience is dumb. And we can put Maybe. this, we can slip this by them. I think remember, it's more, uh, 90, 95% of them are dumb. The hardcores, we got them. But the other guys, they don't know any better. Run it. I think it's more like professional wrestling yeah. where I think if you look at that card and you and you look at John Lineker, Corey Sanhagen, eh, that's going to be a difficult fight to be boring. I, I just don't see that. I think it, that's probably going to be your fight of the night, in my opinion. OK, but when you're looking at a big audience like ESPN, you have to keep them wanting to sit there and watch the card. So I think what you do is you put that fight in a placement uh, where even That's if the next fight is. sucks, you're still riding that high, and then by then you put in a, you plug in another fight that you think is going to be kind of entertainment. So I think, yeah, the the main event and co-main event mean a lot, but I don't think it always really transfers over that way because I think you have that job of wanting to keep the person sitting there and paying attention. The main event has to, to carry step by step. S- some weight a little bit. Like you want that number of, of where they're ranked next to their name. And you want them to sell some tickets. Co-main event, I think. I think what it boils down to, we should have one of the ESPN guys on the show. I'm sure they've been briefed on this. Is 
who's the most likely to be a highlight on ESPN later on? Probably Greg Hardy if he yeah. wins. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But who's going to retain your interest? Sanhagen and Lineker is going to be a war. I cannot wait for that one. All right. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll go back to the middleweight division and talk a little bit about the stakes for Jack Ray Souza and uh, Jack Romanson, as well as the whole middleweight division now that we've had a new interim champion in one of the most epic fights ever. And I'm talking about Israel Adesanya versus Kelvin Gastelum. We kind of have an idea of when Adesanya might fight Calvin Gastelum. And by the way, it looks like Dustin Poirier and Khabib Nurmagomedov are not hiding the fact that they're fighting in Abu Dhabi in September. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll throw that in there when we come back. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation, channel 156.
Take it away, ladies. All jokes aside, I still got a blueberry muffin in my mouth. <laughs> I can barely talk here. All right. Robert Whitaker is going to defend his undisputed title against Israel Adesanya, who's going to bring his interim title to the table. It's going to happen sometime in the fall. I predict November, because they were in Australia in November a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But hell, it might be October, might be December. I don't know. But it will be the fall of 2019. Yo Romero has paid his dues and is an exciting fighter. At some point, he'll come back, but right now, no title, or sorry, no fight is booked. Do you believe the UFC likes him? Yeah. Then I think what I think so. they're probably going to do something sooner than later yeah. with him, just because the age, man. Not very many people have been able to do what he's done for that long. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't believe that there are going to be that many fighters that are going to be able to do that going forward. I think the new age of getting ready to retire now, the way people are, are taking fights earlier, mm -hmm. is probably going to be somewhere around, I think, 36, I think is when people are going to start tapping guys on the shoulder going, eh, I don't know. Kind of like college basketball or what what players stop going to playing four years in college basketball. Right. Now they have longer NBA careers, but you can't do that. Especially when you're the, the the top guys like Kobe. When you look at Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, like they've played so much more than other players because they're constantly in the playoffs. And Team USA. Yeah, that's like an extra two stuff. three months worth of uh, basketball every year that LeBron, they play that other players don't. LeBron, he even shut it down a few weeks early, so he'll literally be his legs will have a break from March of 2019 till about. October of 2019, and he hasn't had that in like 10 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. So the new mixed martial artist is coming in younger and fighting more often because there's more shows. His career is going to be shorter, I think. I think Yo Romero was mm, not a pain in the ass. I think he was just somebody that existed in their stratosphere. And I'm talking about the UFC. But when he knocked out Chris Weidman, do you remember he hopped over the fence and then did that march? Kind of yeah. then did a salute. It was mm -hmm. November of 2016 against Chris Weidman. And I remember, this is the I think the Fertitta still owned the UFC. Man, he's so scary. And he, uh, the, the sale hadn't happened. I can't remember. But I remember they were all on their feet and clapping. And I remember the Fertitta brothers themselves. I think that's when he would, when they were like, we like that guy. Think so? You know what I mean that that's that's our guy. Similar to Shawshank Redemption. Remember when they said Tommy came along? He was a young guy. He was cocky. We liked him. Mm -hmm. It was one that was his moment. So I think Yo Romero can always get the benefit of a friendly booking, but he's got to get healthy and he's got to fight now on April 30th, which is what six days away. He'll turn 42. He's 41 right now. He'll turn 42. So that clock. It's ticking, man. Um, his best years, I would say, are probably behind him. But even though he's on a decline, I think he's still somewhat close to the apex. Yeah. yeah he's he still just, a, a menace, he's a phenomenal. Dude. He's a phenomenal athlete. And combine that with the experience that he carries, you know, uh, I, th I think he's, he still has a few years left. Uh, but Calvin Gastelum had his moment a few weeks ago. So he's always going to get the benefit of a friendly booking. Chris Weidman has a win over Kelvin Gastelum. He's a former world champion. But I don't know where he sits in terms of being a favorite or non-favorite of theirs. I had heard behind the scenes that Chris Weidman used to usually uh, renegotiate with Lorenzo Fertitta, not Dana White. I remember that. So <coughs> Lorenzo Fertitta's gone. I don't know where he stands now, but he's put in his time. Fans like seeing him fight. He competes against the best. He's been there really, really close against some fighters, but he's experienced, you know, a couple more of the, the heartbreaks lately. Anderson Silva has this fight against the killer gorilla. Jared Cannonier, it's coming up. Maybe that might give him one last run, although I, I just don't see it. I think he would still require another fight or two. Um, had he beaten Adesanya, maybe, but Derek Brunson, same thing, man. He's hit. He's had some losses lately. He's got the Spartan Elias Theodoro coming up. 
And then we get back to, again, the Paulo Costas of the world, the Brad Tavares of the world, Shoe Face, and Jack Hermanson. Jack Hermanson right now is the one that can maybe make some noise, and Paulo Costas got a shiny 12-0 and record. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the names that you can keep an eye on. Jer well, Jared Cannonier, to be fair, is now 1-0 and as a middleweight, and if he beats Anderson, maybe, maybe if he can do something like what Adesanya didn't, and that's win, but finish him in Rio de Janeiro, whoo, that might be a statement. Yeah, he's got a good look to him. If he can win and in devastating fashion, uh, it's easy to plug a guy like that in. Yeah. And he's got a fun personality. He's actually pretty fun to talk to. Yeah. That's a little bit of an outlook of the middleweight division. I did want to say this, though. And, and by the way, as of right now, there's no matchup for Kelvin Gastelum, Brad Tavares, Chris Weidman. But, again, Brunson faces Theodoru, and Shoeface faces Jan, Ian, excuse me, the Hurricane uh, Heinich on May 18th at Dos Anjos versus Lee in Rochester, New York. So some of the guys are staying busy. Some of them are coming off an injury. I don't know anything about Brad Tavares when he might be back, nor Yo Romero. Kevin Gastelum just needs to heal up. I mean, he was just in a war, for crying out loud. But how about Dustin Poirier and... Habib Nurmagomedov, usually these fighters are told, don't say anything. Mm -hmm. And they're all just kind of hinting and leading those those little bug eyes on, that, on emojis, you know, when people are tweeting at them. But it sounds like in, in Abu Dhabi, the UFC is going to have a pay-per-view, and these two are going to, I guess, headline it. I don't see how they wouldn't be the headliner. But if you got your calendars out, it's the same weekend that the NFL kicks off their season. I don't know if you know this, but... The NFL released their schedule. So if you have a favorite team, you now know when and where and who they will be playing. So go to NFL.com and check it out. Or check out the NFL channel, which is channel 88 here on Sirius XM. But the NFL season is going to start with a Thursday night game on September 5th. But the real opening day, we'll say, is September 8th. It's a Sunday. It's one week after Labor Day. And that's when all of the rest of the teams uh, are playing. It's a huge day. On the 7th, the night before, apparently the UFC is going to go to Abu Dhabi and have a pay-per-view. And apparently it's going to be headlined by Habib Nurmagomedov and Dustin Poirier. I'm cool with that. I'm not hating on Abu Dhabi. I would love to see that matchup. I think Poirier has earned his spot. I think having Habib come back sooner than November is a nice, how shall we call it, uh, look, he had a, he had this stance of wanting to wait till Oct he wanted to sit out one whole year. October 6, 2018 was when he fought Conor McGregor. So his suspension for jumping over the fence and all that, his was only nine months. He's free to come back in July. But he wanted to sit out the whole year like his brothers, you know, the other guys that also jumped fences and mixed it up with Conor. He wanted to stand by them. The UFC's like, we're not in that business. You know, okay, you're loyal. We get that. But come on, there's got to be a little bit of a compromise here. Mm -hmm. And it looks like maybe September might be it. And that's cool. Look, it still will be 11 months. But don't forget that starting, I think, May 5th or so, Ramadan comes up, the, the Muslim holiday, if, if we can call it that. I guess it's a whole month of observance. Um, and so he is not going to be in any form of a camp during that time and then when he comes off that you can't just have him turn around and fight so i think september is probably as soon as you can get someone like habib to to uh to fight maybe august i suppose but it, it's usually ramadan usually lasts for one month so i think it was going to end somewhere around like the first week of june so now an eight week camp puts you what into august uh, as early as possible i think september probably makes sense he so. still trains during that time period right he just doesn't he just won't camp for right, anyone. right but he's he still like in the way. gym he's still active that type of stuff mm -hmm. and uh, fight promotion i mean that's part of the job too yeah i'm thinking uh the reason why because you're right for the most part we're used to the fighter saying you know i don't know if the ufc wants to talk about that but i'd love to do it blah 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 and now you're starting to see fighters just flat out saying, hey, I'm going there. That's where the fight's going to be. Stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's because the fighters, There's, there used to be like one or two that used to be, I don't want to say bigger than the UFC, but right there. Where they could do things and get away. They could push back and it would be worth something. Ronda Rousey, Conor McGregor, 
But then little by little, that started to trickle down to Daniel Cormier, right? Now I think like a guy like Dustin Poy, Max Holloway, Habib, now they're making enough money where I think they can start to push back a little bit. And these are the type of things you're going to start seeing. No showing press conferences, stuff like that. Stuff that we see in other sports. And it's because they make enough money now where if for some reason the UFC says, well, guess what? You're not fighting for nine months. They'll go, cool. I'll go sit on this mill. I'll be back. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we get with fighters making more money. Right. But I would advise I get fighters, it, if you make 200 and 200 or just 350 to show or 500 to fight, you haven't made it yet. It's a lot from when the fight from when the sport first started. I, you know, so that for sure, I'll give it to you. But I'm telling you, you can run through that money pretty damn quickly. So always remember that you have a short window. And if you're healthy, do it. Um, if you have a great agent that can advise you, then there may be a time where sitting out might make sense. But I'm telling you, you just can't get those years back and you can't get that momentum back. So those have, have to be carefully thought out decisions. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, have you ever seen, do you see when Le'Veon Bell was holding out? Yeah. Now, see, that's a guy goes that makes about a, what he was making four million a year, and he, maybe he wanted ten million, you know. And he's been doing that for quite a few years. And when people would discuss, wow, should he sit out, you know, and you know he couldn't earn money because he wasn't uh, playing, mm -hmm. but hopefully he was going to get the money when he renegotiated. But even a guy like that, if you heard the teammates or the coaches talk you know they they would say hey it's it's not like that's not the type of money that you can retire and that's a guy that's in the millions so that cost MMA that. fighters still have a way to go uh for the ones that are in that that range from a hundred thousand to half a million you know or a million per fight it's the ones that make at least a million per fight i think those are the ones that can maybe buy themselves an additional six months or a year yeah i think of guys like dan henderson and he went through almost three eras where at the end, I think he was making, what, 250 maybe, a fight, right? Something like that. And I think he would just take it fight by fight. But some people would say, man, you're one of the greatest of all time. Just retire. But hell, if you can walk in there and make 250, mm -hmm. why not, right? Mm -hmm. You want to maximize this. I think as you're getting towards the end and you go, man, it sure would be nice to get another 250. I think that's when you look back and go, man, I remember when I was young and I just decided to go do this instead. That cost me a potential 250 later on in my career. Quick segue here, and this was unplanned, so this is maybe even the best the Tip best one to do. Um, I want you to think about this as we go to break, all right? If Dan beats Michael Bisping, is Dan the most decorated MMA fighter ever? Notice I said MMA. That's A. And B, would Bisping still be a Hall of Famer? I'm talking about their second fight. All right, think about that as we go to commercial. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation, Channel 156. We also got the Daily Debate coming up, and we'll talk to you about Dana White and his dabbling into boxing. It's something he's teased now for a couple years, and we haven't seen anything, but he's kind of given us a little bit of a uh, an outlook, if you will, for later this year.
The 2019 NFL Draft is on SiriusXM. Tomorrow night at 8 Eastern, Jason Horowitz, Jim Miller, and Pat Kerwin, and Gil Brandt, excuse me, they bring you every pick of the first round of the NFL Draft. Complete analysis and interviews with players right after they're selected, only on SiriusXM, NFL Radio, Channel 88, and streaming on your phone or at home on SiriusXM connected devices and speakers. So there you have it. Uh, Arizona Cardinals will be picking first, and... Some other shitty teams like the Jets and the Raiders and the Buccaneers, they got some big moves they can be possibly making mm -hmm. because they're way at the top drafting early. Good luck to them all. All right. Dana White. No, no. Try again. You want to do the daily debate? No. Daily debate? Sorry. Daily debate? Blah, blah, blah. The daily debate? No. Hendo. Hendo. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Answer your question. All right. Do you think, I asked those before, and this just popped in my head, if Hendo had beaten Michael Bisping when they rematched, Michael Bisping was the champion. They fought in Manchester, England. Dan Henderson had won. Would he have been the most decorated MMA fighter ever? And would Michael Bisping be in the UFC Hall of Fame? All right. Bisping, I think, would still find his way into the Hall of Fame. Okay. He did a lot for mixed martial arts across the pond. You think when he won the title, that cemented his spot? Probably, yeah. Okay. Um, I agree. I, I think whenever you see somebody that came off of tough, that won a season of tough, and then came back as a coach, it's an indicator that they like them, and more than likely they will end up in a good spot. Like Had that. he not won the title, is he a Hall of Famer? Oh. Michael Had Bisping. I'm going to say still yes. Yeah. See, I think maybe no. But I don't know because he really carried the UK for mm -hmm. a while. Put really MMA in England on the map. And you're right. Winner of Tough. Super popular. Really, really good announcer. You know, broadcaster. Multi-talented. Kind of like a, a great team player. Yeah. So I perhaps I'm wrong. I don't know. But for sure winning the title cemented it. And having the one title defense probably meant a lot to him because he was able to avenge a loss. But, again, what about the Hendo question? Dan Henderson, probably, because here's what Dan... Dan, like I said earlier, has fought over probably three different eras of mixed martial arts. Yep. He even fought early UFC, you know, well, for the he longest was a tournament time. champion. When people... When he came over from Pride... A lot of people looked at it as like he was a pride guy, but really they forgot that he initially was a UFC guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he was he won a tournament. He's won tournaments. That's hard to do in mixed martial arts, and he's won them. Um, he ended Vanderlei's streak. I mean, that was that. Was, or actually, no, I don't think he ended. This. Did he end the streak? I think Arona ended the streak. Huh? Arona did. Yeah, uh, but he no, but he took his title. That's the thing. Uh, here in Vegas, he's done a lot of things for mixed martial arts. He's been successful here in the UFC, and you're saying if he won the title in the UFC as well, mm -hmm. it'd be hard to argue that, man. I think he would have been because he would have been a tournament champion at UFC 17. He would have been a Pride welterweight tournament champion. He was Pride's first welterweight champion and then unified it, uh, or sorry, and uh, then added to that. So he was the first champ champ, if you're talking about the major organizations. Not the UFC, but if you're talking about major organizations, which I think the ones that you can call that are UFC, Strikeforce, Bellator. You know, over the years, to hold those belts, they're considered uh, major belts. One championship deserves that respect. PFL, I think, deserves that respect, even when they were WSOF, um, WEC. Fought and Strike Force, WFA. Strike Force, yeah. Maybe not WFA. I don't know if they have I thought he fought one there. No, I know, no, but I don't no. know if that's like a major belt. I think yeah, yeah. there's now a tier lower than that. Mm -hmm. But regardless, he won the middleweight championship, which is the same. Pride's welterweight and middleweight was the same thing as his in the UFC coming over, winning the middleweight and light heavyweight. But then he went also left the UFC and became the strike force light heavyweight champion so if he would have added a ufc belt to hold a strike force pride and ufc i don't think that's been done and to add the tournament championship that he won in 1998 in the ufc the 2005 pride welterweight grand prix that they had and then the ring of rings 
Mm-hmm. Come on. Has anybody done Strike Force Pride in UFC? No. Ben Henderson, if he were to win Bellator, he'd have a WEC, UFC, Bellator. and Bellator. Eddie Alvarez, if he were to win one championship, he'd have one Bellator and UFC. Gilbert Melendez won WEC Strike Force and was a split decision away from winning UFC. But Pride, Strike Force, and UFC? Yeah. No. Hmm. So that just popped in my head. It's interesting. Yeah. All right, we'll leave the daily debate for the next segment. But I wanted to give you guys an update on Dana White. He wants to get into boxing. He's been teasing that, wearing a Zufa boxing shirt for a while. And then it kind of went away. You know, all this was really, really a hot item, especially in the late summer of 2017 when Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather mixed it up. Can you believe that was 18 months ago? A year and a half ago, goes? No. no. It was, man. It was that long ago. And he, uh, this is what he says about his boxing plans. There's still a go. I'm making all my boxing moves after the summer. And remember, he said uh, that in a few months, he's going to change the game of fighting. So apparently, this summer is going to be pretty big. For one, Dana White Contender Series is back. I don't know if his reality show is going to continue, you know, looking for a fight. They're building that new uh, mini arena that's next to the UFC PI, you know, the UFC campus. Um, but we don't know what those plans are to change the sport of fighting, you know, meaning mixed martial arts. But apparently after all that, in the summer, it looks like he'll dip into boxing somehow. Anyway, we also have some audio cuts in regards to this. So let's play them. Let's start off with uh, cut number one, Anthony Joshua is exactly what the heavyweight division needs, according to Dana White. Yeah, I like Anthony Joshua. You know, I think he's exactly what the heavyweight division needs. What I don't like what they're doing is how they're not fighting the best guys out there right now. The, you know, they have Wilder and they have Fury, who just fought to a draw in an incredible fight that people loved. The rematch isn't happening with those two, and neither one of those two are going to fight Joshua. Here we go again. It's just it's crazy. I mean these guys could 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 do a round-robin fight fight each other You know both guys could fight um, Joshua Ten. and they kill it. They, they'd make so much money and they would Bring so much energy and life back to boxing But these guys just keep shooting themselves in the foot. It's, I, it's I, crazy He's not wrong those three fighting any combo would be nice for the next few years. Hell. Yeah, but the problem is they're They've signed deals. Like they've I, signed I don't deals understand. With like they're, they're, yeah, with either television or digital platforms, and they have their promoters, and it's not as easy as he thinks. And that's been happening in boxing for a while. I think so. What Dana's implying is two minutes. You know, get out of that. Then yeah, I guess that's a whole process. Well, maybe, but I mean, if anybody can do it, it would be guys like like the Fertitta brothers, like Dana White, because they have that type of experience. But the thing is, they're they're not part the boxers have been a part of a certain culture for so long that i don't know that they would be accepting of really the types of things that happen with mixed martial arts the way it's ran he has a he has a big focus on the heavyweight division let's play cuts two and three back to back we have time andre i am making all my boxing moves after this summer when this summer's over You'll be hearing a lot about what I'm doing in the sport of boxing. Will Anthony Joshua be hearing a lot from you? I would like that. I mean, <laughs> right now, Anthony Joshua should be a huge star in the United States, too. But he's not. But he's coming to fight over here yeah. in, in uh, New York City. But that in a isn't necessarily just going to turn you into a big star. Hopefully it does. I hope that happens for him. Who could you get that's more exciting than Wilder? This guy comes out and, you know just throws down and he's wild and he's exciting and he's a good looking dude you know six foot five and he's got all the tools that guy should be a big star too yeah he's focusing a lot on the heavyweight division he's my age we're only like three months apart two months apart something like that so i know he got a little bit of a taste of the end of the muhammad ali era ken norton larry holmes uh ernie shavers joe frazier all those guys george foreman and then leading into tyson who's a good friend of his that's why I think he's focusing on these guys, and he knows that you bring, you sign some heavyweights, you know, to your stable, and you're off to a good start. All right, we'll uh, do a little bit more boxing talk 
just on the other side. We're going to be gone for 60 seconds. We'll be right back. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation, channel 156. All right, just to round out that boxing talk, again, Dana White, the UFC president, wants to get into some boxing. He says it's not going to happen until after this summer, so I guess sometime in the fall of 2019, which probably means the end of 2019 and the early part of 2020, but it sounds like he's pretty serious about it. I guess it could have all just went away, and uh, he'd be still... One of the most successful promoters of any kind. Circuses, pro wrestling, boxing, MMA, you have it, whatever, what have you. Uh, but uh, he actually, his, probably his first love was boxing. And he wants to give it a shot. We have one more cut from that interview that he did. Uh, this is Dana White, the UFC president. And he was... Uh, he was talking to CNN here in this in these last cu cuts that we played, you know, before the top of the hour break, and then this last one. He talks about the heavyweight division and how it's just lacked umph since his good friend Mike Tyson left. The heavyweight division has been so boring for so long. Ever since Tyson left, when Tyson left, oh my God, we had the Klitschko brothers in there, though, a nightmare. Um, and, and now a guy like Anthony Joshua is, is exactly what the sport needs. I, I like everything about the guy. Um, it, it, they, a couple of tweaks to the moves they're making in his career, and this guy could be a huge superstar. Okay, I remember some fights with Riddick Bowe, Evander Holyfield, Lennox Lewis. I, I hear them on the Klitschko's. They weren't very exciting to watch, mm -hmm. except for Klitschko versus Anthony Joshua was amazing. But the heavyweight, the heavyweights kind of had that run, so he's right about that. But I would d politely disagree and say that if you if you're talking about like what a heavyweight fighter usually used to represent, and that's the aura of the baddest man in the world, you know, the handoffs from s some of these guys to the other guys, then, yeah, those guys didn't really have that type of swag. Maybe a little bit of Lennox Lewis, but here in the United States, we were really spoiled by having Tyson and having Muhammad Ali. Uh, but I saw some pretty exciting fights, you know, featuring those, those, those other heavyweights that I mentioned earlier post Mike Tyson. We get into the Klitschko's, and yeah, it's slowed down. Wilder, Fury, and Joshua, there could be something there for the next three to five years. Hmm. But that they're getting a little older. I mean, Joshua and Wilder are okay. Fury, I think, is getting a little bit older. I think. Let me look it up to make sure. I'm I think honest. with those guys, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that those guys are on the same level as, say, Tyson, Holyfield, and Bo? Fury oh, Fury's only 30. I'm sorry. Okay. Fury's only 30. I think they're the best Wilder that we have is now. is 33. So we still but have I, I don't think they're anywhere near the level of those guys. Uh, who are the ones you're comparing them to? Eh, just go Tyson, Holyfield, and Bo. Man, I don't know, Goes Tyson, Holyfield, and Bo, I think, dudes. would take care of, of these dudes. Hmm. I mean, Joshua's like 6'6", mm -hmm. about a solid 250. 
Wilder's lower. He's like 220, but he's 6'6", and he throws some hard punch. He knocked out everybody but now. one, and then Tyson, Tyson Fury's had skills. He's just dabbled a little bit too much with drugs and alcohol. Maybe that's why I thought he was older, but um, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I think they're the best we have now, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know that we can get Lennox was the truth. Lennox was good. Lennox was awesome. Yeah. Holy Skill, field was power. very, very good. Tyson was amazing. It'd be interesting if we could do that. I mean, and then the, even go back a get generation the PlayStation of boxing That'd game, and I guess too. we can have a little bit of fun there and see what that's like. But uh, that's that one's a tough one because let's ask the you uh, always the feel like guy. the the later fighters just are conditioned better, and you know the, the tools and the tricks that they've been able to learn. You know that you would think they just are, are, are better, you know? Mm -hmm. But it'd be hard to believe that anyone could beat Michael Jordan one-on-one, -on -one, right? If you could bring him back to primetime Michael Jordan. Could. Think so? Yeah. But you can't, say that, you can't say that with a slam dunk, though, right? Mm, kind of, but it's only because he's just so big and agile that I think he would just go to the rim every single time. I don't know if Jordan could stop that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Jordan would put up a, a, a really good fight. Hey, am I crazy here? Yeah, I thought Washington. I didn't oh. know. I, I didn't know. The, I thought the Capitals had been eliminated. No, this is Game Seven. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought they got eliminated in the last game. No. I misspoke the other day. I said, "Wow, the two or yesterday, the two oh, uh, Etchkin eliminated someone the other night. The two finalists from last year's Stanley Fury. Cup are out. I think I said something like that, or or close to being out. Oh, that meltdown by the Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, anyway, that's a little bit of boxing Oracle. talk there. Stay tuned to the end of summer and see what uh, Zufa Boxing has in their plans. According to the UFC president, Dana White, they're going to tackle that soon. Okay. Oh, can I ask you one more question about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that an exit plan? No, because you just locked in seven. Oh, you mean after yeah. this? In other words, maybe because that's not day to day. Build it for seven years. Yeah. But when I'm done with the UFC, now I got this nice little thing here. So is that an maybe exit plan? Cause, yeah, because it's not day to day, and I could see him as he gets older, not just having to fucking wake up to phone call after phone call or text after text, and all these other problems. You know, managing a six fighter, six hundred person roster. You got to figure that 60 of them are idiots that are going to get in trouble and all that. Mm -hmm. In boxing, it's Steel probably, cars. you know, just it's nowhere near near that. I wanted to talk a little bit about the rankings. We publish, and I'm talking about USA Today Sports and MMA Junkie, our rankings every Tuesday. Last couple of Tuesdays, I've been talking a little bit about, you know, the, the moves that have been made, give you a little bit of an explanation, and feel free to always agree or disagree with any of our moves but there really, there really wasn't much there really wasn't much to do uh, we had the Ryzen show Kyoji Hiraguchi fought on that card and even though they had a new champion King Mo lost this fight out there King Mo nor the winner jury the neither one of those guys uh, well Mo was, suffered the loss mm -hmm. but the winner just didn't have enough to really do anything that mattered uh, in the light heavyweight rankings because basically the UFC kind of has a stranglehold on on the top 15, top 18 if you will including our honorable mention. But Kyoji Horiguchi he's been pretty staying pretty busy as a bantamweight and as a bantamweight he defeated Ben Wynn but Ben Wynn isn't really a bantamweight so there really wasn't too much to do other than uh, we recommended or I recommended um, that he just kind of stay still and not do anything. There really wasn't a move to make in the Bantamweight division based off that win over win. In other words, the win fight, the win-win, you like that? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't carry much weight. Mm, I was but about to Horia ask you Gucci that. is still becoming... A pretty amazing fighter with his resume at light heavyweight. Sorry, at flyweight, and now at bantamweight, he's a stud. I put him behind Bibiano Fernandez. Bibiano Fernandez didn't lose a fight for like eight years. He did lose one and then regained his title. So I think if Horiguchi Hori had defeated somebody that was more of a name, then maybe we move him past Bibiano Fernandez because Fernandez again had that recent loss. But 
Ben wins just not going to do it. So for any of you wondering about that, that's the reason there. At heavyweight, the Ream defeated Alexei Olenek, Sergei Pavlovich defeated Marcelo Golm and Shamil Abdurakimov defeated Marcin Tabora. Uh, Marcin Tabora had to exit. He's four and four in the last 36 months. He had to exit the rankings altogether, and it's weird because he was number 14, I think, and number 15 was Olenek. It's just Olenek fought a higher ranked fighter. And Olenek's run in the last 36 months is more of like a 4-3 and three run. So he actually saved himself in honorable mention land. And we promoted Chick Congo and Ryan Bader up from honorable mention up to uh, heavyweight. Those we are found two out are going to be fighting fighters. each other. They are going to be fighting each other. And Congo's won like 10 straight or something like that. And then Bader just became the Grand Prix champion and also the Bellator heavyweight champion. So you would think the champion would be ahead of Congo, but I tried to throw a little bit of an executive decision, you know, pending the approval of the editors who also chime in as well, saying, I know that doesn't look right, but Congo's run is 10 deep. I mean, mm -hmm. Bader's was, it's, it, it, was a, it was a heavyweight run because you can't take away anything from Fedor and you can't take any, anything away from Mitrion, especially Mitrion. Fedor's kind of been on and off, but still he's one of the greatest of all time. But he also beat King Mo along the way, and King Mo's not really a heavyweight. So, oh, but he is very successful. He fought, yeah, he fought as a heavyweight, but again, it wasn't like none of those guys were really, really ranked. Whereas I Congo, I, I, he's had he's beaten Volkov and Minikov, and both of those guys were ranked. So that's why. I mean, look, we're not going to argue over fourteen and fifteen, but I felt like if you really, really wanted wanted to look right and feel right, that that was the call, and I think they were with me on that one. Uh, Abdur. Abdurakhimov, wait, Abdurakhimov got promoted to honorable mention. Justin Willis barely hangs on to his spot as well. What you talking about, Willis? Mm -hmm. uh, at light heavyweight, sorry, at lightweight, Islam Makachev is now 17 and one overall, 16 and one in the UFC with a five fight win streak. Had to bump good old Michael Chandler, Ooh. and the reason is because Chandler just doesn't have some of the competition uh, that. You know, a guy like Makachev has had. Makachev, yeah, sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name. Uh, also, Chandler had a, that recent loss to Brett Primus. Granted, he beat Primus, but Primus mm -hmm. beat him. And I think that's what it boiled down to a little bit more was Makachev has just had a little bit more of a run. And remember, the runs in the UFC are they're, you're just consistently fighting higher quality of fighters. Well, it's, it's not meant to be a disrespect, but you look at any rankings from 1 to 100. And you'll see that the UFC fighters just go against tougher competition consistently. That's what I was going to ask you is what are you going to do now with guys like Eddie Alvarez, guys like Demetrius Johnson, who carry weight, but they're going to be fighting lesser competition. The road up just is a longer road up, and the road down can be a quick tumble can if DJ you lose. Can DJ maintain his spot by mm -hmm. winning? Win and finish, for sure. Can he be overtaken even winning? It would have to be someone he didn't face. That would help. Mm -hmm. But if it's anybody that Demetrius waxed before he lost to Cejudo, or just beat, I should say, not waxed, but you know, he beat Benavides twice and Borg and a few of the other guys. If it was any of them, I mean, those guys have to like just get on an amazing run or acquire the belt from Cejudo. Then that would create a round robin between that fighter, Cejudo, and Johnson. Uh, but, yeah, if Johnson just keeps winning and especially finishing, then I think he can at least hold his spot. He won for a long time. He defended his belt. All the check marks that you look for in a ranked fighter, he, he has. But if he takes a loss, it could be a little bit of a tumble as well. It all depends on what kind of a run he's in. The last move was Antonina Shevchenko and Roxanne Modafferi. We're talking about women's flyweight. There, Mox Roxanne Modafferi, she's had, a, she's had a good resurgence, especially through the season of tough and then post that. Antony Shashenko has an amazing record in combat sports altogether as a Muay Thai practitioner and as a MMA fighter. But she hadn't really fought those elite names yet, the ranked names. So even though she, you know, her sister's the champ and she's looked great, Roxanne beat so beat Roxanne beating her it was a, it was a nice win and that's all we can call it at this point. Um, so Roxanne just 
I recommend if she switched spots with Caitlin Shukagian because Caitlin Shukagian lost recently to Jessica I. And I think she's two and one since becoming a flyweight. And Roxanne Mataferi, she's only lost to number four Sajara Eubanks, number three Nico Montana, and number nine Jennifer Maya. And along the way, I think I mentioned this yesterday, she beat Bob Honchak, um, and Mara Romero Barella, and also now Antonina Shoshenko. So I thought the I thought the move was uh, legit. Especially with Kaitlyn Chikagan dropping that fight. In fact, if Kaitlyn Chikagan hadn't dropped that fight, it would be her probably facing Valentina Shoshenko and not just yeah. the guy. So it was a big, big fight back then that we just didn't know about much. Um, because since then, Nico Montano, she had a little bit of the USADA problems. Uh, there's a statement by her, uh, by the way, on MMA Junkie. And lastly, uh, Sajara Eubanks looks like she's got to make the move to 35. So things opened up a little bit for some of these ladies and if you want to go back to jesse jess she had a close fight with jessica i had she won that and then beaten maybe caitlin chikagan that could have been her although right now she's very uh, marketable. she's got an uh, injury that she's coming back from and i don't think it's going to keep her out that long i saw her at the gym recently and she's in really good spirits all right uh right now I think we, oh, I may have ran over. Let's take a break. I want to do that. Let's take a break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156. We're going to be coming back and talking to Sarah Kaufman, so don't touch that dial.
All right, we're back. Who did you say goes? Who are the members from Junkie Nation that you're seeing together? Uh, Steve Carroll and Ray from San Antonio. Look at Where they at? Some beers in, in San, Antonio. San Antonio. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's pretty cool. The other day I saw Lerone Ganey and Showtime. From uh, Tennessee, it was his time. They were in Philadelphia, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was his time. They'll be here Friday, by the way. Who? Cool. Showtime. Again? Mm-hmm. Nice. What brings him to town? Work? Probably. All right. All right. We have Sarah Kaufman ready to go. Sarah Kaufman is going to be fighting for the PFL. That's the professional, professional excuse me, Fighters League. And it's called PFL 2019 Week 1. They're going to be fighting in Uniondale, New York, and it's going to feature the PFL welterweights and the PFL women's lightweight division. Uh, Sarah Kaufman's a former Bantamweight champion at Strike Force, and most recently she won the Bantamweight title over at Invicta. So she's got some belts, man. She's a name. She'll be facing Morgan Fryer, and that play, uh, takes place in a couple weeks here on May 9th. She joins us now on the hotline. Hi, Sarah. Welcome back to MMA Junkie Radio. How are you? Hi there. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. All right. You're on with George and Goes. It's always great talking to you. And we got a little bit of a surprise when we were told that you were joining the PFL and you'd be part of the regular season and tournament because I had remembered you had recently won the belt over at Invicta. So were you in a free agent position where you could do this type of a negotiation or did you work with Invicta to be able to take advantage of this opportunity to fight for PFL? I was signed with Invicta uh, and Shannon has always been uh, a big proponent and has always said that she'll never kind of hold people um, if there's other opportunities and especially if at the time it's the right decision and I think it was it was you know sad for both of us to leave because of, uh, I've worked with Shannon Shannon Knapp for, for years back when she was a strike force and then to see how much she's done to push uh, you know women in the sport of mixed martial arts uh, and really hold value for all the females I mean a lot of the top champions uh, in other organizations have come through Invicta, and Invicta has been a, a huge platform, uh, you know, for for the sport, you know, to grow. And, and I think PFL is doing something similar in that they're having a different, you know, bringing something different to MMA. Um, and so what Shannon has done with the women and, and creating such a platform like that, you know, the PFL is doing by bringing this new format, kind of having the sports league as opposed to just random fight. Uh, and so it was great that, that Invicta and Shannon were willing to work with me and, and allow my release to, to move on to work with the PFL, and uh, we have a great relationship still. Now, you called it an opportunity, and what was the most attractive part of the opportunity? Was it the fact that you can possibly win a million dollars in about eight months or is it just adding another belt to your collection or maybe both uh you know i think the belt for me is the thing i care about the least i've never really cared about a belt aside from the fact that i want to be the best in the world and if that means having a belt uh then i want the belt but in terms of an actual artifact i don't care uh i'd rather fight a lot and so the the million dollars is a huge uh, incentive, mm -hmm. but then also the opportunity to have four fights for the females between May and the end of December was one of the biggest selling points because my career has been stuck with so many times where I'm ready, I'm willing to fight, I'm ready to step in on any any fight, short notice, long term, doesn't matter, and you know the opponent says no, or the promotion says no because they don't have a, an opponent for me, and so with the PFL, with the, the league format, you know, anyone who signs in to be part of the bracket, uh, you know, you can't, you can't turn down fights. You're just given a fight. You, from the regular season, you get your points. That moves you on directly to a seated position for the playoffs. Uh, and then from there, it's just literally numbers uh, and, and opponents. So it's a, it's a really it has a strong allure for me to, to be part of it, and I'm, I'm glad that it worked out. Now, if I'm not mistaken, because of the point system, there's a chance you could face Kayla Harrison in the regular season, or there's a chance you guys may not face each other and face each other possibly in the tournament should you both advance. Would you, li would you like to face her 
twice in one season or just one time in one season? Like, how do you view that since she comes in with kind of a lot of hype? Yeah, I don't know how they do the initial matchmaking for the, the regular season. I would think that they would choose to keep us on kind of a different side. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, we could face each other in, in the next, like, regular season uh, match. But the PFL decides those, so who knows what they decide. Um, and then once it gets to the, the playoff format, you know, there's no control. So PFL can control who they match up for their initial matchup. Um, and, but then it's all by, based on points. How, you know, do you win a fight in the first round? Do you get a draw? Do you lose? How does that all look? Um, and, and how that, how your points work out in terms of the seating. But I think ideally, you know, fighting Kayla in the finals would be, would be amazing because it would bring a lot of attention to the finals. Um, and then also it'd be a, a big opportunity to win a million dollars for me or for her, but for me. <laughs> Sarah Kaufman is our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. You can follow her on Twitter at MMA Sarah, former Invicta Bantamweight champ and former Strike Force Bantamweight champ. All right, goes. What do you have for Sarah Kaufman? Sarah, when we're looking at all the fighters in the tournament, men or or females, and we're breaking down who's gonna who we believe will have the most success, one of the things that you can point to is experience, and you have a ton of experience. I feel like that's one of the biggest weapons in in a regular season and then having to do a playoff. Um, when you look at Kayla Harrison, she's very impressive as well, but for as good as she's done and the things that she says, she says a lot of the right things. I feel like that experience factor is going to at some point kick in and possibly hurt her. Do you feel like even though she comes from a decorated uh, background in another sport, can that experience level transfer over in MMA, or is MMA just a completely different beast? MMA is its own sport. You know, competing at a high level is, of course, a benefit, whether it's in judo, whether it's in soccer, whether it's in kickboxing. I mean, for sure, combat experience, so having matches, having multiple matches, uh, you know, is, is a benefit. You know, but anytime you're performing on a big stage, uh, you know, there's experience to competing under pressure, which I think is kind of what it's all about. But at the end of the day, coming down to, you know, time in the cage, experience with different people, different body types, uh, different strengths, different weaknesses, uh, you really can't buy experience in the MMA cage aside from being in there. And that definitely is a, is a huge, huge advantage for me. I've seen you do some work out here in Las Vegas, and that, and one of the things that I've admired about your career is your your game has always evolved, and it's always gone, you know, with, with the trends in mixed martial arts. You've gone to different camps to test things out, but in this format that the PFL offers, are you going to set in to one particular way, like one camp, and stick to it the whole way through, or will you have that ability to still kind of try new things and go to different places? You know, I've always, you know, I've always been with my coach, Adam Sujek. Um, I've been with my team since I first started, and that will never change. And he's always kind of encouraged me to, to branch out and to work with people that, you know, we both respect and that, uh, you know, if they can add something to my game, then that's great. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with Greg Jackson uh, and, the Winkle, and Mike Winklejohn and, and down in Albuquerque. Uh, over the years, and then last year I had the opportunity to work with uh, the Rufus Sport Camp um, for my Invicta fights, which is amazing. Um, you know, and, and then I went down and helped Joanne at Syndicate for her fight uh, when she fought in Brooklyn. So, you know, I, I'm just very fortunate that I've been able to work with different amazing people in the sport and have a really good relationship with with everyone that I've worked with. Um, at the end of the day, it, it always comes down to just what I'm doing at Zuma and with Adam and, and with my team, and then able to add in uh, that positive input um, and, and different training partners is huge, and just different like-minded individuals it is really helpful. So, um, you know, I'll probably I'll probably be down in Vegas at some point, um, either helping helping Joanne or Roxanne or, or or the other girls out there for their fight. Um, get some training for myself. It's a quick flight. Um, I'd love to go back out to to Rufus Ford and, and see the crew out there. Um, again, it's 
with the format that we're doing and the consistent fight to kind of know when you're fighting. Um, and just depending on what opponents I, I pull out, um, you know, I'm, I brought some people up to, to work with me for this camp. Um, so it's, it's just finding body types that are appropriate and trying to find girls who are, who are heavier because it's different working with females than it is with males. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just gonna, gonna fight how I'm gonna fight and, uh, I think it's gonna be quite successful. Sarah Kaufman's our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. She fights Morgan Fryer on May 9th. That's coming up here. You can watch the fights on ESPN2. It's part of PFL 2019 Week 1. We have women's lightweight and men's welterweight on display here as they start off Season 2. Uh, remember, there's a regular season and a playoff format in which the fighters from six different divisions can possibly win a million dollars at the end of the year just like they did in season one on december 31st and that was an epic night sarah just two more questions and we really appreciate your time when you were a bantamweight yeah of course and you dehydrated your body to make 135 what did you rehydrate to usually kind of like an average of uh usually i fight about between 149 and 152 okay so how much? But I wasn't super small at 135. Right. So how much of the game or the sure. blueprint is for you to add a little bit of you know muscle or or just add a little bit of weight because you are going to compete at two divisions higher, but at the same time not lose any of that edge that made you a world champion at at bantamweight and and we've seen a lot of fighters uh, move up and do well. So it's not necessarily the bigger athlete is is the the one at the advantage. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not actually trying to get bigger. I think that I'm strong and I'm fast and I'm fit, and I don't think that I need to be heavier and cut weight to get to 155. Um, I think that that extra weight that I would put on would actually slow me down and take away a lot of those advantages that you're talking about. Uh -huh. So I'm just happy to, uh, you know, really just be healthy in camp, you know, fully, fully eat, fully hydrate. Um, and it, it's really only, you know, I'm probably not quite as lean as I am when I'm, you know, 146, 147, getting ready to cut weight. Mm -hmm. But it, it's only the difference of five or six pounds. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it's just great that I've been able to just fully train and not be concerned about, oh, I have to do an extra run or I have to do an extra run and eat less. Uh, you know, I'm doing the same work that I was doing. I'm feeling great doing them, feeling super strong, and then able to fully have uh you know everything i need to replenish my body in between sessions and so it, it's it's going to be great it's going to be a little bit weird on fight week not having uh kind of the stress of making weight right um because i'm already i'm already under so i'm just hovering right where i need to be and i'll probably end up weighing in about 153 for the fight 154 somewhere in there and uh it's going to be it's going to be easy mm -hmm. my last question is this one You've been in the sport for about 13 years. It looks like your first fight was in 2006. We're now in 2019. I wanted you to compare That's women's crazy. MMA back then to how it is now, but in relation to the following question. When you were training in 2006, I got to imagine, even if there was just one guy in the gym that said, oh, these girls, or just any form of uh, negativity towards women's MMA or whatever, or maybe you were at a gym that just didn't have that at all. I don't know. You can tell me. Compare that then to how it, how is it now. Are there still any of those negative Nancy dudes that just don't appreciate women's MMA or don't respect the women's MMA? Or can you honestly say that you are now accepted 100% wherever you go? I'm fortunate in that, you know, starting with Zoom and starting with Adam, I was actually the first fighter out of the gym. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, Adam started mostly with women's kickboxing. And then he had, like, a grappling program that there was a couple girls in already. And so I've been fortunate that I really haven't encountered uh, in my gym that feeling of, oh, well, what are you doing? Because I've always been part of the gym and a pretty big part of the gym. I help run the gym. And so we have a very... Uh, well, we have a no tolerance really for, for attitude uh -huh. that's across that line. Uh, I mean, there's definitely have been people more in the public who have not cared for it as much and have had, 
you know, their negative comments or their dismissive comments or, um, you know, there's always going to be people and there probably still are people, yeah. but definitely with the, you know, with strike force and then UFC bringing, you know, the, the women's division over, you know, particularly from Rhonda, uh, you know, that whole wave, there are so many people now, it's very common that they say, oh, the female fights are the most exciting on the card. They're the ones I look forward to the most. And when right. there's fight cards that don't have female fighters on the card, I'm disappointed. And so it's been a huge switch in that regard from, well, it's cool that you do it, but I don't really want to watch it, to I almost don't want to watch a fight card that doesn't have at least one female fight on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty neat transition in what is seemingly a short period of time in, in the span of, of a lifetime. Yeah, because I got to tell you, about a week ago, Clarissa Shields fought, and a lot of people were talking about that fight, like, hey, it's coming up. Hey, it's tonight. And then, hey, did you see that fight? Then we had WrestleMania a few weeks ago. Same thing, triple threat match featuring uh, the ladies. There's 35 WrestleManias. This was the first one where they headlined it. Uh, in a few weeks, uh, Rose is, Nama Yunus is going to defend against Jessica Andraj in the top bill. Valentina is a co-main event, but she's still, you know, being promoted as kind of like a dual main, uh, you know, two title fight type yeah. of setting there in Chicago and. Um, so, like, the the women in all combat sports are just on fire, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm glad things have changed, but I imagine yeah, there's still a few haters out there. Yeah, that particular card, I think it has, like, five or six female fights on it. Like, it has a lot of female fights, which is so great to see. Um, you know, that it's not just one or two sporadically added in, but it's a really big feature on the cards. And I mean, even five years ago, that, that really wouldn't have been the case. Well, I want you to know you're a big part of that. You know, you've put in your time. You've paid your dues. Your name is recognizable. PFL was smart in going after a fighter like yourself. So, you know, uh, I hope you're proud of your accomplishments. You, Rhonda, Gina, Cyborg, Misha, you know, Leslie Smith. So many of you put have put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and it's it's recognized by a lot of the hardcore MMA fans and a lot of the MMA media. Um, so, you know, th thank you for... Continue for not giving up and continuing to put on great fights in these past 13 years. And we want to wish you the best of luck with the rest of your camp and obviously good luck on May 9th at PFL. Oh, did yep. we lose her? Is she there, Andre? Yeah, she's here. Okay. Uh, well, sir, I don't <laughs> know if you can hear us, <laughs> but uh, I, we can't hear you, so... If you can hear us, thank you so much for the interview, and I guess maybe we lost connection with you. But anyway, um, we're not hearing anything from her, Andre, so I, I guess just put her on hold, and, and if you can talk to her, thank her for the interview. And let's, let's go to a quick commercial here. We're going to come back with James Krause, UFC lightweight slash welterweight.
Participation awards. They have boxes of gold stars that they purchase themselves. They are the legends and demand your respect. Here are George and Goes. Tonight at 10.30 Eastern, the Golden State Warriors look to close out their series against the LA Clippers when they face off in Game 5 of the first round playoff series. Catch all the action on NBA Radio, Series 207, XM86, and streaming on Series XM connected devices and speakers. Joining us now is James Krause, UFC lightweight and welterweight. Also head coach to fighters like Zach Cummings and Megan Anderson. He's riding a five-fight win streak, and I just want to know where the hell he's been. James Krause, how you doing? How come you haven't been fighting? You're on a streak, brother. <laughs> Man, you guys, we've talked before. Uh, I don't, uh, I just don't, I don't like to fight. I don't have the volume that some of these other guys. I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I'm going on 13 years and like probably 60, close to 65 stone amateur. Uh, I just have other stuff I'm trying to set myself up with outside of fighting. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I will be back soon, though. As soon as I get uh, Grant, Zach, and Megan through this Rochester card, I'll, I'll probably look to get back in myself. You're right. We have spoken about this before. Uh, but I feel like right now is just these runs, you know, five in a row is, is not easy to do in the UFC. You know what I mean? And then to be able to do it, to top it all off, throughout two different divisions and that number 32 i feel like that's one of those numbers where any fighter you ask even the guys that blossom late or the ones that's that may have started early but still have gas left in the tank they can still call their prime i was like huh okay it's kind of a a little bit of a shame here that, that uh he's not fighting but okay it's all under your control you're healthy and this is the way you want it yeah i mean it's uh yeah, I would consider myself in my prime, but man, I don't. I, I like I said, I, I fight. Uh, I fight when I when I when I want to, and if I don't have that, uh, if I don't have that fire, you know, to get up out of bed, you know, I mean, I've been doing this for 13 years, and man, sometimes I just wake up just just all kinds of you know messed up and injuries and all kinds of stuff, and you know, I really, I thoroughly get. I think more so than anything, I really get joy out of out of coaching, and uh, man, my. Uh, you know, I enjoy I enjoy competing still, but the fulfillment that I get definitely comes from uh, definitely comes from uh, from coaching. So uh, I will get back in there, and, and I, I do agree. I'm doing myself a, a disservice by not seeing it through all the way, and I do intend to see, you know, to see what I can do and how far I how how far I can uh, you know go, how far I can take it if I can you know whatever whatever that looks like. I don't I don't really. I don't know, but I do intend on seeing it all the way through, and I, I do feel like I'm in my prime. Uh, I definitely, uh, technically, am the and the best I've ever been. Uh, I don't ever stop training. I train every day, twice a day. I could probably take a short notice fight uh, tomorrow if I needed to. I typically like three or four weeks of like you know of prep time just to you know ramp up uh, strength conditioning and stuff like that. But uh, I stay ready pretty much most of the time. Uh, but I'm not huge on on taking short notice fights. I could if I wanted to, but uh, yeah, man, there's just I got a lot going on outside of fighting, and uh, I don't, I just don't really see a point in rushing it, and and uh, yeah, I just don't, I don't, I don't feel the need to to fight four times a year like a lot of these guys do, so I don't. Mm-hmm. What about that zipper on your shin? Is that finally cured? That the, <laughs> it yeah. looked like you added that with uh, yeah. what was it, MRSA? Yeah, man, it was it was M S S A. It was it was rough, man. That was uh, I haven't really had too many in, in, uh, injuries in the sport, but that was that was the first and only surgery I've ever had, uh, and that was that was a tough one. That took a long, and it's still not the same. I still don't really have any feeling in my in my right shin over it, and uh, there's a couple spots that are like hypersensitive that they send like a tingle. That like if somebody rides shin to shin, like trying to pass or something like that, it'll send a weird jolt down that I'm still getting used to, but. Uh, yeah, that was a that one was a tough one to get over. Your name had just kind of popped up lately. I thought you had a cool picture with Dustin Poirier. Uh, I remember seeing the the zipper on your shin, and then James, uh, sorry, um, Julian Marquez is a Vegas guy, and I talked to him from time to time, and he's always talked about you run a great practice. You're an excellent coach. Oh, I love the pick with Mark Montoya. So you had been on my mind in that regard. I was like, and when I went to look you up just to see, does he have something? booked and we're just not hearing about it or what i didn't see anything and i was like ah, i gotta i gotta ask him what's the deal here because because like i say um it's very commendable when a fighter can dabble in two divisions hold a streak be healthy you know what i mean so at least i'm glad yeah, that from I your mean, end I'm it's on you there. yeah 
Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna get back in there. Uh, June. I'm looking for uh, May 18th is the Rochester card. I have three guys on that, and uh, you know, I, I really, I really, they've been working really hard, and I'm excited to watch all three of them compete. Uh, after that, though, everything's gonna be fair game. If ideally for me, I would like a mid mid June to any time in July. Uh, I have another uh, another baby on the way due in September, so I definitely you know would like to fight uh, in in summertime. Uh, if possible, so maybe I can even maybe maybe I can sneak another short notice replacement in or something like that before September. But uh, I would definitely June, mid June, uh, July is on my radar. When you're done fighting, and I would like somebody. I would like somebody good. Yeah, of course. Right. When you're done fighting, is coaching going to be possibly the number one thing that dominates your life, or will you be a continue to be a businessman, gym owner? Or, you know, you got other ideas. Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, the answer is yes to all of those. Uh, I, coaching is for sure a, a primary. It's something that I really enjoy doing, mm -hmm. and it's really a, it's a primary in my life now. I, I really enjoy coaching, man. I, I uh, I've kind of developed a I, I obsess over this stuff. I, I can't, you know, I don't really know how to explain it other other than that. I, I obsess over it, and I kind of develop my own little my own little style <laughs> that's uh, that's working really well right now, and uh, I, I really do enjoy that aspect of it, but. Also, I will continue to, to grow my gym as a business, and I will continue to dabble in other things outside of that. I just I'm a big believer in in uh, doing multiple multiple things, especially with like real estate and stuff like that. I don't really have to put much energy into it, so that's that's set up for that's a long term a long term plan. And uh, one of my goals, <clears throat> I haven't really talked. I don't even know if I've mentioned this to anybody, but <clears throat> one of my one of my long-term goals when I'm done fighting is I want to be able to help. Uh, I want to be able to help fighters, I, I, I guess, set themselves up financially for, for after fighting uh -huh. because I see this too often. These guys, they don't have shit to show for the, you know, the brain being battered and stuff over the course of 10 years. They're physically, you know, some of these guys have a hard time getting out of bed. And I just I see it all too often where these guys are forced to do things like take fights they don't want to, and I just I, I want to help bridge that gap on on that because I do think that there is a, a huge void in our sport with helping our our athletes uh, become something after after this after they're done with the sport. Hey, that's commendable, my man. If anybody can do it, you sure can. That's for sure. Uh, all right, so listen, I know this is daddy time, and uh, you got to get going. But, hey, at least we got a couple answers, and we look forward to a fight booking and seeing you get down sometime in the summer. But in the meantime, good luck to all your fighters. Sounds like you got that big fight card coming up with a, a lot of your guy, guys and gals running. So good luck with all that, and uh, we'll keep in touch throughout the summer so we can preview your next fight. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys a ton, as always. All right, thank you, sir. Take care. On Twitter, at the James Krause. And right now, it's time for the Daily Debate. The Brothers Garcia seemingly can't agree on anything. Everybody knows it's duck season. Rabbit season. Duck season. Rabbit season. Whether it's food. That's filling. Tastes great. That's filling. Tastes great. Gambling. Always bet on black. I like red. Black. Red. Black. Red. Black, dummy. Or even social media. Instagram. Snapchat. Instagram. Snapchat. The same applies to the biggest stories in MMA. Time for MMA Junkie Radio's Daily Debate. Today's hashtag daily debate question for at MMA Junkie Radio. What chance does the Rory McDonald John Fitch hashtag Bellator 220 winner have of being able to turn it around in seven weeks and fight Neiman Gracie at hashtag Bellator NYC? Goes, is this guaranteed, likely, unlikely, or no chance? No chance. All right. Zero chance, I'm going to say. Wow. Surprise you? A little bit. Would you like to know why? I would. Well, that's funny because that's what I thought. Okay. Let me tell you why. Hmm. Here's what's going on. A guy like Newman Gracie requires specialized training, I think. Uh, he's not the type of guy that you just turn around and fight. Mm -hmm. Okay? If John Fitch wins that fight, more than likely, I believe it's going to go the distance. Okay? I don't think he's going to finish Rory McDonald. That's, that requires recovery time. Then turn it around. Specialized training for a guy like Newman Gracie. That's going to be tough. Okay. He's 41. How much more specialized is he going to get, though? Hey, man. This is probably one of the... I mean, there's a lot of money at stake here. And BJ Penn's got some jiu-jitsu, and he fought him. Okay. I'm sure we could 
look in the depths of other guys he's fought, Jake Shields. Rory McDonald, if you look up and down his record, he doesn't really come in and dispatch of people. He's done it, but it doesn't happen too often. Mm -hmm. It's more of a decision guy. And if he loses, and even in some wins, he's taken some damage. Oh, yeah. And there's going to be some recovery time I for something what you're like that. About. Yeah. Oh, nice. I like that. So I just don't see it. Not with these two fighters. But zero, huh? Not, not one of them can be a, a Joker Hermanson and get a choke real quick and then boom, ready to go in seven weeks. Zero. zero. I heard you. All right. Well, I'm not that far behind. I'm with unlikely, and I, a lot of it has to do with kind of what, with what you covered. I guess I'm being a little bit more positive maybe, and I do see that McDonald has the type of skill set where he could just possibly piece up Fitch. If Fitch can't get this fight to the ground, mm -hmm. Oof, you know, he's long with the jab, and uh, he's very, very dangerous, you know, with elbows and knees. And uh, So, I, of the two, I see Rory being able to do this more. You're right. Fitch utilizes 25 minutes to beat the shit out of somebody. And to turn around, first got to recover from that. Hope that, you know, the bruises, the bumps, the, the cuts, everything else aren't so bad that you can heal up in time and get in there and... I guess start your next camp. You know, I I don't even know what he would do. So the timing of it is a little bit not I wouldn't say fishy, but uh, optimistic on their end. They're gonna need a little bit of help for sure. But I would go with unlikely. Part of it's optimism, and part of it's because I think McDonald has a little bit of that's who I'm going with in this fight is McDonald. I I see McDonald kind of having that type of success. Mm -hmm. um, but let's let's see what happens. This is how it broke down. Forty three percent said unlikely. With me, I'd never win these, but I won. Been on fire lately. Thirty-five percent said likely. Twelve percent said guaranteed, and ten percent were with you with no chance. So, man, I've been at the bottom lately. Hmm. I've been at the bottom lately. Yeah. There you have it. There's the daily debate brought to you by Gorgeous George and Ghost. All right. Want to give some shout-outs here to the YouTube chat. Big boys cry too. He uh, <laughs> listening here. He's talking about Israel versus Whitaker. Any thoughts on that matchup? It is going to be epic. Two amazing strikers. I think Whitaker is a little bit more of a well-rounded fighter, although Izzy seems to just get better and better. He takes these strides that by the time they fight, I think they'll, it'll be kind of a, a pick'em type fight. You know, I think so. As far as the odds go, maybe Whitaker, you know, because he's been in some of these tougher battles, he might get a little bit more of the love. But Minus remember, the odds the also yeah. carry a little bit of the popularity game, and. I don't see too many people not knowing who Izzy is after this incredible run that he's had. Not to say that he's any less popular or more popular than Whitaker. Mm -hmm. He's just, he's just, uh, you know, very popular right now. He's it. Also, a shout out to Saggy underscore Boxer sixty nine says he loves the show. <laughs> Keep it up. Because I have great names. Jesus Valencia, <laughs> shout out to him. He says, "What happened to Yol and Souza? Yol backed out." He pulled out because of an injury, so now it's Souza versus Joker Hermanson on Saturday at UFC on ESPN3. Although earlier in the show I said, let me explain what's happening. It's called UFC on ESPN3, but it's been taken off ESPN, and it'll be on ESPN+. Plus. So you won't get to see it. You can't just go to your neighborhood-friendly bar and just say, hey, put it on 206 if you have DirecTV or whatever it is that ESPN is on your la other satellite or cable listings. You have to have it on ESPN+, Plus, which means tablet, phone. Or if there's a bar out there that has the whole hookup, then good on them. Can I go back to that first gentleman with sure. the funny name? Uh, uh, also, last shout-out to Eric Renee says, yo, what's up? Uh, I'm talking, I'm George, and that's goes. All right, go ahead. Yo, what up? Uh, that fight, Izzy and Whitaker, remind me a lot of Demetrius and Cejudo. I just wish it happened a little, like one more fight later for Izzy. I feel like whatever happens here may not matter because they'll probably end up fighting again and I think if they do you'll see a different Israel Adesanya because you're right he's growing fight to fight to fight but I don't know that growth will be enough to contend with a guy like Robert Whitaker. How cool would it be though if they fought three times once in Australia once in New Zealand once in the States. That'd be cool. Like if that turned out to be a, a big oceanic type coin of for the rivalry. Lot. Yeah. Yeah I like that. Alright thanks to Sarah Kaufman for her time. Thanks to James Krause for his time. Shout out to Andre the Giant for producing today's show. I'm sure Josh is somewhere in the background. Always a shout out to him. And uh, goes, you did a good job today. Thanks. You're welcome. I, however, took it to another level. I was fantastic. We will see you all tomorrow with another edition of M MMA Junkie Radio. I think we'll have three guests. Two of them I know. One's John Howard. The other one's Five, the Schmo. Four, He'll be on tomorrow's three. show. Should be fun. Two.
Champions.